All right, y'all, good afternoon. Um, before we start, I realize we have a rambunctious panel of ladies, and we decided that um, to start the way that uh, Ellen was, was at the Oscars or the Emmys, um, we want to take a selfie with everyone. And so if everyone could stand up, we're going to quickly take a photo, and then we're going to dive into everything you want to know. Let's do it. My team knows me. They're like, it's okay. Me. There we go. Careful, All right, let's see. Okay. Oops, sorry. Y'all ready? Yes. Okay, one, two, three. All right. I love it. <laughs> okay. We're going to make this Emmy Award winning, so we might as well start it off like that. Um, we're going to start uh, introducing each of our uh, panelists up here. I want to start just your name, who you work for, what you're doing, but also the idea of what was a turning point in your career that got you to where you want to be. Uh, why don't we start all the way at the end? All right. Hi, everyone. It's super to be here with you. I'm Elsa Zambrano. I work at NXP Semiconductors, and we are in the semiconductor business. So if you have a phone and you pay with your phone, Apple Pay or something like that, you're using our chip technology. Or if you have a newer car and there's a lot of infotainment in it, you're using our chip technology in it. So a little bit about what we do. We're a global company. We've got about 30,000 employees across the globe. Um, let's see. I, what I do at NXP is I'm the Senior Vice President for Talent and Culture, HRIS, Global HR Operations, and Global Talent Acquisition, and have a lot of fun doing that. So to answer the question, Tom, I, I would tell you that maybe my, a turning point for me, you know, I think all of us have a few turning points, but a turning point for me is I did an expat assignment while I was working at Dell. And it turned out to be a lot harder than I thought it was going to be for two reasons. I went to LATAM to run Latin America, and I speak Spanish, so I thought it would be easier, but I realized really fast I don't speak business Spanish. So like, I was like presenting, I'm like, feedback? How do you say feedback in Spanish? I have no idea. So it was, it was really stressful, actually. Um, the second thing that I learned there was not everybody is inspired in the same way. And as a leader, you really have to sort of read what works and where you might be or who you might be with. It, it goes so much more beyond just what you know or what you aim to do. It is really about how do you inspire and motivate people for discretionary effort and what they have to do. So that was a good learning for me. I love that inspiration. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ramona Aurora, and I'm a member of the Dell Technologies team. And we have a table over here of our Dell folks. We're about 130,000 global employees, over 123 sites around the world. And I have the great fortune of having the best job that I think exists at Dell, though I'm a little bit biased, which is leading learning and development for the organization. Um, and so that touches everybody from our recent grads that come in and our interns all the way up to our senior executives who you know, still have a thing or two to learn in their, in their careers. When I think about um, a life-changing moment, potentially, I think that um, I just started talking about this very openly. I held it in for many years. But um, I flunked out of college after my second year. Um, that was the time when they used to mail you, uh, you know, your transcript and a letter. Um, and I wasn't a big mail person back then. And so they kept mailing me um, at home. My parents were very respectful. And they kept saying, like, your 1.7 GPA, you're going to lose your scholarship, Ramona. OK, 1.6, you might want to pick up those grades. Um, but I just kind of ignored that a little bit, and I didn't really open the mail. And then when I went to go uh, register for my third year, I was locked out of the system. And then when I called the registrar, they were like, you're no longer a student here because you failed to meet the minimum 2.0 average. Um, why is that a pivotal point? Well, I think I did pretty OK in the end. But I think at that moment, I was, first of all, very terrified of what my parents would do. They're immigrants. Education, getting education was incredibly important. I was also on a full ride of scholarship, so I lost all of that. Um, but it taught me to figure things out um, through a bathroom door where I was crying in tears, afraid to look at my mom in the face. She whispered through the door, what are you going to do about it? Um, and so I've taught myself, and I think I keep that with me, where it's to know that the answer is usually in you. And I think I take that into my coaching practice with my team and also to people that I've coached in the past. But I also know there's resiliency, and I also know it's also really important to check in with yourself a couple times 
be like, am I doing what I want to do? Am I where I want to be? And where I want to go? If you don't do that often enough, even for my 10-year-old son, I ask him, what do you want to do? Are you, are you doing what you want to do? Are you playing baseball the way you want to play baseball? OK, just making sure that it's important to check in uh, with ourselves once in a while. Awesome. So I guess I'm the third immigrant in a row up here in the panel. Uh, my name is Leah Ikasa, and I work for USA. I have been uh, 25 years serving our employees, uh, employees not just at USA, but in general with my career, um, helping, serving them and their careers. I've been with USA for 16 years. For those of you who don't know who USA is, we support the military community. We're very, very proud in helping them and empowering them to reach their financial security, their financial peace. Uh, we are both a, a PNC uh, insurance company and financial services company. Pivotal uh, place in my career, very much like Elsa. I you know, speak Spanish, grew up speaking Spanish, and at some point early in my career, I was working for a bank and there was a consulting arm in the bank and they had just gotten an award for a, um, a, a contract in Puerto Rico. And they didn't have anybody to serve it. They didn't have anybody that spoke Spanish. And they were literally running around asking who speaks Spanish. And I was like, well, well I do, I do. I want to go. go to Puerto Rico. And I knew before going to Puerto Rico that I did not speak business Spanish. Right, and you know, my parents very similar to Ramona, and I'm sure Elsa. My father was a PhD, and he was like, "Oh my God, what are you gonna do?" And I'm like, "I'm gonna start practicing reading books, reading all these financial books before I get there, and just practice all our, all the manuals." And I remember after my first night, uh, after my first day, I called my mom and I said, "Mom, I." did it. I don't know where the words were coming from, <laughs> but the vocabulary was there. <laughs> Retroalimentación, Elsa, feedback. <laughs> and it was just, it was magical. It opened up so many doors for me being a consultant, and I got to meet my husband. Oh, so. right. There you go. Can't beat that. <laughs> yes. All right. Hard acts to follow for sure. Um, I'm Rebecca Warren. Uh, I am with Eightfold AI. So we are a machine learning and AI uh, organization that uh, provides a software to help. Uh, our mission statement is to help everyone find the right career uh, for them. So the right career for everyone in the world. Uh, so I run a team of customer success professionals to help our clients uh, get to use our uh, platform. Uh, engage in adoption as well as help them build strategies all the way from uh, folks entering into the recruiting process all the way through uh, succession planning and talent management, so the full slate. Um, I've been with Eightfold for about two and a half years. Uh, prior to that was uh, in the talent acquisition space all the way from uh, entry level sourcer recruiter up through senior director at several large restaurant and retail organizations. Um, Pivotal moments for me, like my goal has always been, I'm gonna work for a company um, and as long as I'm adding value and having fun, that's the right place for me to be. And when I'm not doing one of those two or both, it's time to move on. And I hit that spot right around the pandemic. Um, and one of the things that uh, the pandemic taught me is, um, life is too short to do what you don't wanna do or live where you don't wanna live. So we left Nashville and moved to Arizona, and I joined Eightfold. I had no idea about customer success, no idea what the organization did. So I did that six to 12 months, that agreement of, if I'm horrible at this job, just boot me, and no harm, no foul. And if I'm not having fun, I'm going to boot myself, no harm, no foul. I'm still here, so I guess we're, we're, we have a good relationship going on. Um, but I think that's, that's what has been the most important to me is, I don't have a, a clear trajectory, right? This is my third career, so I started out in youth and family ministry. I was a youth director, then moved into HR, where I actually could pay people to you know, do the jobs that I needed them to do, um, into TA, and now moved into here. So that's really been my philosophy. Um, not a direct career path, but I want to continue to add value and uh, have fun while we're doing it. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Mel Faxon. I'm the COO and co-founder of Mirza. Um, we're building a world where employees no longer have to choose between family and career. 
Um, and we're, we do that, we help employers retain employees by offsetting the costs of care. Um, a pivotal moment for me, so I've spent the bulk of my career in startups across the US and Europe um, in hospitality and tourism industries. And really seen firsthand, you know, if you don't have care, you can't go to work, you can't get paid. And seeing that implication both from the employee side and also the operational efficiency side. Um, and then I think, but the key moment that really sticks out in my mind and I think got me to where I am now, um, I was working and I had the, I was a product manager. There was this amazing woman, a senior product manager who was going to come lead this project that I was uh, really involved in. I was so excited to learn from her. And I remember exactly where we were standing when she said, Mel, I'm quitting because I can't do both. I can't be a mom and have my job right now. And that just felt so unfair. So have really kind of dedicated um, what, we're, what, we're, what we're building at Mirza to solving that problem. Awesome. Y'all have incredible stories. It was great learning about where you're from, where you're going. Um, Let's dive into things. Um, we know right now there's been a slowdown in hiring. There have been reorganizations within companies. And with that in mind, how much of a focus are you putting on sort of internal mobility within your companies, moving people into other roles that um, in some cases they maybe don't have experience, but where that help is needed? So let's start first with uh, Elsa, and then whoever else wants to comment, dive in. All right. Uh, I mean, the short answer is yes. We're much more focused on internal mobility than we've ever been before. Um, we're kind of taking the, the, the angle that development really can start where you're at. So many people, if they feel stuck in their career, say, well, I've got to change jobs. And we're really taking the angle, you can change your job, but you can do it within the company. So we've had actually quite a few initiatives over the last 18 months. Um, we just ran a series of stories in our internal uh, newspaper, I'll call it, where we highlighted four employees actually that had left NXP and then returned and told a little bit about that story because it's, there's a lot to learn you know, about what that, what that experience is. So we're really trying to energize our own internal team members to think about moving their careers, upgrading, developing, but doing it within the company. So we've started to measure internal mobility. Uh, we're just under 20%. It's too low. Our goal is 30%. And we're trying to measure that, but we started at about 14%. So we're making good progress on that. We've changed some of our policies to make it easier for employees to move. Uh, and so that's a little bit about how we're tackling that yeah. issue. Leah, did you want to weigh in on that? Add to that, absolutely. Uh, that is also one of our focuses. Uh, that's a big focus for my team as well. And just to give you an example, <clears throat> not only are we tracking, but we even have our CEO speaking about it in, in public forums, in town hall meetings. Just recently, about a couple of weeks ago, in one of our town hall meetings, uh, we have one of our new executive directors that came in and was talking about her trajectory uh, within the company. And she started out front line, she was on the phones and how she moved all the way up and gave an example. And our CEO was really wanting to put that in front of the employees to say, hey, you can do this too, right? It is now one of our metrics. We look at it in our scorecard. Um, and the you know we measure employees' um, in, intentional movement, right? So we're not looking at it, its promotions, lateral moves, and we also measure demotions as well. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, and we want to really be able to recognize that careers have seasons, right? And depending on where you are in life and what's going on, not just professionally, but in your personal life, you may want to change. And that change may have to be a demotion. And other times, you may want to have a demotion in order to gain a skill, right? And so career for us isn't upward. It is really a lattice, right? And, and we are measuring that and keeping track of that. Add that. Um, I think that you have to make a decision in your organization, right? It's I, we always talk about build, borrow, and buy, right? Am I going to am I going to build it within? Am I going to buy it? You know, go and recruit and buy, um, or am I going to use contingent laborers and, and contractors? Well, contingent laborers are short. There's like the pool is getting tighter and tighter. 
um, to buy labor, right? To go and find people and recruit them out in the workforce is is it's a very 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 demanding, um, difficult market. I would say, especially for technology companies right now. Even though we have a lot of folks that are you know that have been let go over the last several months, but it's just really difficult um, as you're trying to cut costs and whatnot. So you look inwards and you think, okay, we've got talent inside. What can I do with them? Um, and I would say about last year, um, we have several business units and our most senior executives met and they were talking about, you know, they were doing their org health planning and they were looking about what are those capabilities that we need for the whole company. And every business unit is walking through those capabilities and they realize that there's actually a lot of capabilities that exist across the entire organization. And so typically I think a lot of companies think about career growth and getting talent moving up and down verticals. And we have to shift our thinking to actually like, it's talent across the company. It's not my talent, it's not your talent, it's not their talent, it's our talent. So how do we move people gracefully um, and also intelligently across the organization? And so that goes to building. And so for somebody who leads the talent development organization, I partner incredibly closely for the first time, I would say, it's one HR, right? You have to be looking at TA, who's looking at all the benchmarks in the external, thinking about also where are the open recs at, where are the needs at. You're working with my colleague, Christine, in the front row over here, who manages talent management for the entire company, our architecture group, and is thinking about the skills ecosystem, and the skills intelligence that we need to build the career mobility, and what kind of data do we need to go and filter that in. And so you have to look at your infrastructure. I have Mitch Lee here, who works with our technology team, right? You have to think about what the technology you're going to lean on to go build the infrastructure so that talent can move. So when you ask, like, you know, where is our focus right now, I would say that it's become one of our deep, deep focuses for the entire H organization and certainly a priority for the whole company as we go to look at how to build capabilities internally across Dell that can move across the company. It's interesting. We just, at, at my company, we had a guy who was in the sports department who's now in charge of our website. So people have shift all over the places. With, with this in mind, I just sort of a follow-up, how if for someone in, in these scenarios who wants to switch to a different path, how do you put the building blocks in place for them to maybe get those gaps filled in the areas that they're not an expert in yet? And I don't have anyone in mind necessarily for that, but uh, yeah, Leah, go for it. <laughs> Um, so, absolutely. One of the things that we've done is actually uh, we have built a skills um, infrastructure, right? And we've used the skills um, in the past and, and um, to really look at what are the skills required for each of the jobs, uh, the, the, both the soft skills and the technical skills, right? And so that really helps us identify where, what people need to do and be able to help us with the skills gap. Now, one of the things that's interesting is you can look at that and you can, you can map it out, employees can map it out, but what you can also do is create those learning paths, right? And just and as an example, we had um, one of our executives was saying, okay, um, HR, I need to hire you know, 200 data scientists you know, in you know, 14 months, and everybody's like panicking, right? Where do you get data scientists in 14 months? So they're like, okay, Leah, you guys have to really create a learning path. With that learning path, what we did is we looked at the next of kin, right? So it wasn't about the example that we showed two weeks ago where you had a frontline employee move all the way up to ED. It was like, what's that family? What's that next of kin? And what are the gaps from that role to the data scientist role? And then, and then the question was, well, aren't you going to create another gap? You know, you're going to create another labor shortage. And I'm like, that's brilliant because then that continues down the line and then everybody gets developed. Then you end up with internal mobility. So yeah, so you, ha you have to create that, and for us, skills has been a great way to do it. Yeah, go uh, ahead, Rebecca. I can tack on to that as well. So what Eightfold does is a lot of that work as well. So we have the ability for our clients to be able to go in and map where all their skills are, where folks are going, so you can do succession planning, what is that development from a manager perspective, right? What do your managers think that your person needs to do? But then also looking at your internal employees using a career hub model where they can go in and say, hey, I can do this. I want to join this internal project to bolster my skills in X. Or I want to take, uh, I want to get to this particular position. So I'm going to take these courses that are served up for me in order for me to get to that next level. So inside of Eightfold, we offer opportunities for not only 
internal folks to decide where do they want to go and build their own career path, but then also from a managerial perspective, whether it's talent review or succession planning, looking at where everybody is and identifying those gaps before they become a huge problem for the organization. So getting ahead of it, and then as, as you were saying there too, uh, Ramona, about building, buying, how do we internally then, um, we have some clients who are building a project-based uh, process inside of their organization to be able to say, hey, we're not gonna, we're not, we're gonna use you as a floating consultant inside our organization. You get the skill sets, we get your time, and then that gives them an opportunity to round out their skills as well. So lots of ways for clients to do that manually, but um, also using technology, using AI um, and machine learning to help folks map that out as well. Do you want to add? Yeah, I think, and then it's the human side of all this, right? So, um, you know, I think we're pretty used to having end of year conversations and performance conversations, and they're on the cycle. And one of the think transformative things that I've seen in the last um, year and in a bit actually is around conversations that happen all the time, right? There's not like, you know, you're a leader and it's like, I'm just going to go enter my quarterly conversation. And it's like, no, these are conversations you're having on a weekly, monthly basis with your team member, getting to know what their interests are, giving them feedback about how they're performing on the job, capturing that feedback, thinking about where the gaps are that they can go fill in. So they can also be on par and think about where are my gaps? Do I want to fill these? Or actually, do I just not like this job? I go back to like, wasn't in the right major, you know, many years ago and got to help team members also figure out they're in the right major, right? Maybe they should be in a, in a different part of the organization and then thinking about how they, how do we connect them with different opportunities. Um, there's been a lot of cleanup as well. I think this is where you partner with TA, but also how the, in, the intelligence you get from even just job recs, right? And so you've got, I remember uh, two years ago, we started our skills transformation work and we realized that there was like 32 different ways on how people were like naming like project management, right? And so how are you supposed to find a project manager if it's named 32 different ways? How do we equalize the skills ecosystem? And so cleaning all that up, going from thousands and thousands of skills and distilling them into like those critical skills and how they're named and how they're formed and the attached proficiencies, that allows you to also maneuver the skill build, right, happening within an organization. So I think the human side is first having conversations and figuring out what do people want to do? Helping them find mentors and connecting with people who may be doing things that they want to do, and then making sure you're also cleaning up your in-house, right, yeah. to support all of that. Yeah. Elsa, do you want to? I'll add a bit there. I'm going to lean into the, the emotional human side of it because I think all of the process, procedures, frameworks, policies, programs are great, and you, and you need them. But I think from a culture point of view, you, you, I think we, you do have to have a culture that embraces mobility and embraces the ability to move about and develop yourself. If you can have the best policies, but if you don't have a culture that encourages that, it's, it's not going to work. So um, this week, um, actually, it's funny how um, things come together, but at NXP, we uh, launched a global event, uh, a week-long global event that we called Growth Week because we're trying to nurture that culture of what we say, grow your mind, grow your career. And so we're doing that because we want to put a very strong message out to our organization that says we want you to develop. So we had external speakers, we had panels, we had internal speakers, we had webinars relative to how you give feedback, webinars on how you grow, webinars on our engineering academies, on our other academies so they can develop their skill set. Because we feel that if we start there with culture, that then from there we can have more successful programs or frameworks that, again, encourage and nurture development for our people. First job where you know, if, you, if I had gone to my leader and said, hey, I think I want to go work for somebody else, it would have been like, and yeah. you're terminated tomorrow, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so that yep. talent hoarding mentality, that's which right. is, yeah. that's a part of the culture, right? right? And that, exactly. that psychological safety to say, I might want yeah, to we're trying to. Different. Yeah, exactly. You have to break that down because that is super strong in organizations. Like, you can't take my person. I love them. They're so good at what they do. And before you know it, you, don't, you can't move. You have to leave the company. Yeah. And I want to talk more about that exact situation when someone says they want to leave in a little bit. But first, I want to fold Mel into, our, into the conversation <laughs> with a question Taylor made for you. A lot of, I mean, almost all of us, you know, have families. We're, we're thinking about having families. If we don't, that involves children. And so many of the decisions we're making now, where we want to live, who we want to work for, sort of focus, you know, family first. 
how can we, you know, in companies support people and help help make those decisions internally as a company that focus on on families? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, 61% of households are dual income families now. So in the last 50 years, we've shifted and that's dub that number's doubled. So you don't have someone at home taking care of kids, right? You really need to think about how can your employees have, have both. Um, I think I'll just pick one, one response to this, but creating a culture of psychological safety where you acknowledge that people have kids or they might want kids and you build that into their career path and make that available to them. And then having that top-down culture where it's okay to be a parent. And that might mean equal parental leave for you know birth, non-birth parents and taking that leave, having leaders take that leave and really just emphasizing that this is something you want people to have makes a huge difference. And I'd love to hear what, what all you are doing as well. But. Well, I'm of the idea of remote work now. So that was one of the things with Eightfold. We are fully remote and our whole organization is. And I love when I get on calls with clients or even with our internal teams, you get to see more about who they are, right? You get to see the dogs and you get to see the cats and the kids and, and their their homes and you, you feel more connected to who they am as a person. And I'll say I love working remotely because I feel like I'm actually getting the money out of my house now. <laughs> I'm actually in it more than out of it as a opposed to before. Um, but the idea that our families are part of who we are and, and being able to block that on your calendars, right? To say, hey, this is family time and we have that in our organization. Our calendars are open. Everybody can see what everybody else is doing. And it may be a doctor's appointment. It may be um, going to the kids' recital. It may be going for a walk, uh, you know, family time. So we are very transparent about making sure that folks know um, we have families and they're important to us and we're going to block our time. We're going to give 100% um, when we're at work. And and sometimes for us, that means maybe you go hang out with the kids from three to six and then you're back on at eight o'clock and, you know, you've got two hours of work planned. But being able, I think, to see that and feel like that's accepted Whereas before, like, you don't bring your dog to work except on the one day a year, right? I mean, here you get a chance to see, like, hey, Cosmo, be quiet. Like, you hear, you know, people saying that in the background and whatever. So I feel like it, it feels to me like we're in a space where that is becoming more accepted. Um, it, it, this is just a simple ad. I just remember early in my career getting the advice as a um, female to not mention my family. Right? Definitely don't mention your kids. No and I just, yeah, and I just, I remember that. We've come a long ways. Long but, way, baby. Yeah. That, yes. <laughs> that ties into this other thing that, Mel, you brought up in sort of the, the discussions leading up to this, uh, idea known as the parenthood penalty. It's somewhat self-explanatory, but can you go in, in depth on that a little bit? And how do we avoid the parenthood penalty? Yeah, so a little bit of Mel explaining coming at you. But if we think about the gender pay gap, if you control for experience, location, job title, um, industry, it's 98 cents to a dollar, and then we have kids. And that's where the gap comes from, up to you know 81 cents to a dollar for women to men. And 80% of that gap is the motherhood or the parenthood penalty. So it's the decline in earnings that you see once you have children. Um, it's been mostly attributed to women, but any stay-at-home parent or someone taking time out of the workforce is going to experience this. For one year unpaid out of the workforce, a woman loses 39% of her lifetime earnings. So it's not just, oh, my salary right now, it's the long-term compounded contributions to your retirement fund, career acceleration, et cetera. So it's significant. And, and you know, we're, we're talking about dual income families, we're talking about this. How do we support folks in being able to return to work? Um, I think a lot of that is proactive planning, it's helping people with the resources to know what does childcare costs or what will that look like for your family? How are you both going to navigate getting to work at picking kids up, going home? Um, but also, you know, it's just, there, I mean, there's so much I can keep going forever, <laughs> but it really is the financial health of your employees and their ability to come back to work and participate. And so putting structures in place that support them to do that is, is key. Ramona? Well, I actually had to Google parenthood penalty about 20 minutes before the panel because I was like, what is that? First, I was like, dudes don't get penalized for being dads, right? So I was thinking of all these things in my head. But um, honestly, I think it even extends beyond parenthood. I think that um, caregivers in general, right? We've got so many colleagues of ours. We kind of had a peek into their homes during COVID who are taking care of aging parents. 
um, who are taking care of special needs siblings, for example. There's, there's, it's the caregiver. The caregiver. Um, and I feel like I had to Google that because I work for a company that really celebrates flexibility and choice. So whether it's hybrid or remote, whatever it is, it's that I have the flexibility and the choice, the empowerment to figure out if I got to go pick up my kids at 2 o'clock from school to go take them to something, I can go and do that and I won't be penalized and won't be looked at that I'm choosing them over the company, right? That, I mean, really, I'm working, am I working to live or am I living to work? Like that definition has to be, I think, embedded in the culture of the organization to give, to permit people to. But I would say that even when it's written in documentation, one of the things that I hear with a lot of our recent grads and our hires is that I need permission still. So I know it's on the paper and I know that there's policy around that or that you know it's part of our culture code and I see it on posters around the room or there's benefits leading me to childcare benefits and whatnot, but am I permitted? Is it okay? And so I think it goes to leadership and back to those conversations of knowing the whole employee. Um, I think that was a conversation early this morning. We kicked it off with the whole self, the whole person. And so when leaders have a, an opportunity to go meet their people and meet them where they're at, then they can provide the permission to say it's okay to choose to take care of your family um, or your loved one or a friend, for example, in need. Um, it doesn't mean that you're not, you're less committed to the work that you do. So could I just add one yeah. thing to that? So that all of this absolutely helps us to wrap back around to that skills-based conversation. Because if you think about what it takes to run a home, you think about what it takes to engage with children, you think about what it takes to whatever you're doing to get people back in the workforce when you can look at skill sets as opposed to looking at a resume, right? Or looking at particular things that someone has done, regardless of where your journey's taken you, to be able to look at what skills somebody needs to do that job, to be able to switch industries, to switch inside your organization, to be able to come back or to even try something completely new. When you focus on what skills are needed and what potential looks like or what, what uh, folks really want to do, what that natural talent looks like, it's a completely different conversation than saying looking at a resume and this is the only, per this is the only thing someone can do um, is what's on the resume. I want to try to get in a couple more questions. The clock is ticking. But um, among a, a couple of you mentioned that one of the things that really can set employees up for success is having that mentor or the ally or the, the sponsor. Can you explain how that leads to success and how that works in your company? Um, and whoever really wants to jump in on that, fire away. That at Dell, we, we call them the ships. And we think it's like a progression, if you imagine, right? So I think there's this, this kind of baseline of the allyship. And that might move on to you know, mentorship. And then we've heard a lot over the last few years around sponsorship. And I think it, you know, people kind of go directly to sponsorship. I said, well, let's just first like develop the allyship. I think it's like a fundamental opportunity to think about, number one, to empower people to think about how can I connect and support others, but also acknowledge when I need an ally and how to go find an ally. Um, and so we have, I think there's a lot of ways that companies are, are looking at doing this. One, of course, is, is through um, connection opportunities, whether it's through their, ER, their employee resource groups, their ERGs, also through programs, um, you know, whether it's learning and development programs, talent development programs, um, and then even events and whatnot. But also, I think there's also this, this, you need to understand yourself when you need an ally and how to go find it. Um, and helping people figure out, you know, think from day one, don't wait until the person has a problem, but also like incorporating that into onboarding and making it part of your culture that, you know, we have allyship here. And so I think this morning we heard about DEI programs and the compliance and educating people about the definitions and what this means and why we should have them. You know, moving beyond that now, it's not why we should have them. It's like, how do I myself, how am I responsible to be an ally and finding an ally? Um, and if we can turn that inwards and think about how we are the change individually, I think that's when you start to see it trickle. Um, and then you start to see the mentorship and the sponsorship start to, to flow in those ships as they sail. <laughs> Okay, um, another question that I'm gonna jump to, which is something you talked about earlier. Sometimes people are just ready for a new challenge. They say they wanna try something else somewhere else. What do you do in that situation and how is that handled? Well, I can throw out an yeah. example from my husband. Um, he was in a talent acquisition role. He was working for an agency finding IT consultants, which is tough. Um, and he was done. He was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done. And so he started looking for another role. 
Um, and he said, I want to do something where I can work basically my nine to five. And when I shut it down, I shut it down. I can't handle the stress. I don't want to do it. I'm like, that's fine because I thrive on the stress and he certainly does it. We're a good match that way. And so what he said is I want to work for a company that's going to give me that. And that's all. And so when he started interviewing, he was very transparent. And I think from the organizational side, you have to be really clear about what that looks like, right? He's like, I don't want to go into leadership. I want to come in. I will do a great job. I'm going to do do my job and I'm going to go home. And if I don't like it, I'm going to leave. And they have absolutely embraced that. They say, hey, Jeff, do you want to do this? He's like, no, I really don't. They're like, okay, that's great. Because we think that, you know, the job you're doing is great. He started in Nashville um, going into the office and they said, hey, we think you're awesome. We don't have a remote uh, policy, but we're going to create one because we want to keep you as an employee. That's been fabulous for him. He is so much less stress-free and he's he feels comfortable, that, that place of trust, right, to say, no, I don't want to do that. It's not that I don't like you. It's not that I won't try something new, but that's not an area that I, I'm, I want to go into. So I think creating that sense inside your organization for folks to say yes or for folks to say no and to be really clear about it. And he gets a call from the CEO of the organization checking in on him and he's like, I'm great, Mike. I'm doing well and this is what I want to do. And he works his 5.30 to 2 and he gets to play video games from 2 until 6 until I get done with work and it's great. So I think getting the people the the opportunity to say, this is what I want to do, and then as organizations to say, we hear you and we're not going to either derail your career or move you into something you don't want to do, which is forcing you to quit. Yeah. I, I would love to add to that. Yeah. Speaking of letting people do what they love to do, right? Uh, we have just piloted or beginning to pilot talent um, marketplace, and I don't know how many of you out there are familiar with it, but to me, this is where L&D on steroids meet talent acquisition. So you give the opportunities, the chance, the employees, the chance to work part-time gigs in addition to their day job. Right, And so it gives them the chance to try a new skill, to develop a new skill, or perhaps it's a skill that I already have, and I want the visibility. I want to find then my next opportunity, right? So I'm going to showcase my skill. And so the business goes out there and they'll post a part-time opportunity and the employees can go out there and shop based on the skill. Excellent. Okay, we're in our, our, at the very end. I want to just give all of y'all maybe an opportunity on what you would really like the audience to, to leave with. Like, what's, what, what's some words of wisdom that, that you could share? I don't, Elsa, are you comfortable diving in on that? Sure. Um, listen, I, I, again, uh, maybe a little bit of what I said earlier. You know, you have lots and lots of examples of programs and policies, lots of great work being done out there. Um, don't forget how work gets done and what the culture is and what the behaviors are and trust and respect. Those examples just given require trust and respect. So think about, if you will, that softer side of how we get work done and, and the culture and how we can help to create one that empowers all of that. Um, I think this is an opportunity for 1HR where you really do need to lean into TA. You have to lean into your technology teams to, to build that technology infrastructure and, the, and, and how that's going to support the philosophy and the culture that you're wanting to drive. And gone are those days where we have an idea, we put up on a poster, we send emails out, and we expect everything to just kind of fall into its place. We need the technology. We need the AI. We need the AI, I'll say it, right? It's not that we're limiting jobs. We need people to understand how the AI can, can support all of this in our organization and find the partners and the companies, the vendors, the technology needed. And, and I think that's where you start to see the upskilling that we need for ourselves, right? The things that I need to know for my job today in L&D did not exist 10 years ago. I need to really understand data, for example, and how that's going to feed into my skills intelligence. And how do I pull that from the outside and the inside in? And then you need your business partners. You need your leaders to understand how this is all going to tie together. So it's the, I think it's one of the first opportunities that we've had to really think about um, career growth from a 1HR perspective, pulling all the pieces together so we can all you know, make it happen. We all do a lot of great things. Uh, don't forget to measure. And don't forget to make sure that those measures are meaningful. So in addition to, for example, measuring your internal mobility, uh, measure one of the things that we also measure is severance cost avoidance as a result of internal mobility. So find the measures that are meaningful to the business, celebrate those, and communicate those. 
because we love people and we forget that we're in the business to do business. So I will say use all of the tools you can to make your life easier so you can do the work that you want to do. Again, I'll go back to that. Life is too short to do work that you don't want to do. So use the tools to help you take that work off your plate so you get to do the stuff that focuses on people, that allows you to strategize, that allows you to move yourself and your organization forward. Um, and I'll borrow what Ramona said earlier about are you working to live or living to work? And how can you help your employees who also have lives outside of work really thrive and put structures and mechanisms in place to support that? Y'all have been incredible. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>